had a lot uh, to cover still. Um, uh, and you, you, if you come with me to First uh, Corinthians and chapter 8, yes, First Corinthians and chapter 8, it says in verse 1, Now, as touching things offered unto idols, now, as touching things offered unto idols, go back to chapter 7. In chapter 7 and verse 1, it says in verse 1, Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, so uh, apparently then Paul was a in fact go to chapter go to chapter four chapter four and uh, verse uh, verse uh, sixteen uh, verse sixteen right or verse fifteen one five first Corinthians four fifteen for though you have ten thousand instructors in Christ yet have you not many fathers for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. He says, wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. So he's, in, he's instructing the Corinthians on how to be followers of him, right? Then he goes all the way, yeah, in chapter 7, right? He now says in verse 1, now concerning the things whereof you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Yeah, what kind of touch? Verse 2 says to avoid fornication. So we know it is that kind of touch that is sexual in nature and could cause a brother and sister to go overboard into sexual impurity. So the touch there is not just a uh, physical one person touching another or holding hands. No, it is that sexual touch. Now, anyway, so 1 Corinthians 7, 1, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. Now that tells you something, that although Paul uh, considered himself to be their father in the Lord, right although paul was their minister yeah by impression uh, the implication is that paul was that kind of minister that the church could respond to after he had taught them in fact the corinthians did not even go about it the correct way but paul still responded look at first corinthians 7 now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me yeah so number one he had taught them Number two, they now wrote or responded to him based on what he had taught them. So he anticipated that they would have questions for him. So he anticipated that they would have questions. He, he taught them. Notice he didn't just say, well, I've already taught you, bye-bye. No, he, he taught them. They wrote him. In other words, they questioned him and he responded to their questions. That's a pastor right so when you are discipling people or training people we must make ourselves available as brethren to be questioned well somebody says no 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 you can't ask me questions i'm your teacher you are the student listen and bye bye no as brethren we have uh, that opportunity to exchange so the one i'm teaching comes back to me with a question i don't point the person and say go back go go away no i listen to the person and then i respond even though what I'm going to say might evidently be what the person have, what the person should have heard before. So now concerning the things, and now who do you do this for? You can't do this for the whole world. Yeah, people don't get that. You see, you can the way you teach your local assembly is not the way you're going to teach the whole world, right? Paul was a teacher of the Corinthians, a father to the Corinthians, and therefore the Corinthians could ask him questions. Oh no, somebody says, Well, that guy is my spiritual father. I can't ask him questions. He talks, I listen, bye-bye. No, that is not Paul's example. Paul's example is a father listens to the questions of the of the students and he responds to them. So first Corinthians 7 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. So they wrote, he acknowledged it, and he responded to their query. So it is a scriptural, fatherly, apostolic scripture uh, thing, biblical thing, to anticipate questions from those we've taught, who we expect to have listened well to us, uh, and in reality, they might not have listened like they should have. I mean, which one of us listens as well as we should have? We do our best, is the best you can say. But in reality, often there's still a lot of attention we could have placed on what we have been taught. But nonetheless, the pastor of a local church, the, the, the leader of a subgroup, the one discipling another Christian, anticipate questions. Anticipate that the guys are going to write unto you. And when they write or when they say, they may not say it the way you want them to say it, but you are going to acknowledge that they've written unto you and you are going to answer it. That is Pauline. Now, if I say I follow Paul, but people cannot ask me questions concerning what I've already said, 
that instead I have to tell them, look, I've already taught you, go away and listen to that again. No, it says now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. Look, if you're somebody that is given to painstakingly teaching people, I'm telling you that it does wear you down sometimes when people come back with questions. But thus is, su such is the long suffering that belongs in training people. You see, training people or leadership, it's not a child's play. So Paul would say, now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me. So it will, you see, just like they were to acknowledge his writing to them, he was to acknowledge their writing to him where they are evidently querying or asking questions about what he had taught them. Let me say one more time. It means that education in the local assembly is a two-way street. The teacher is going to teach and then the congregation are going to respond. The teacher, when the, the teacher that expects the congregation to listen to him must listen to the, to the questions of the congregation. And that is where both parties develop patience. No, so 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good that it begins once again. Now go to chapter 8. Yeah, chapter 8 and verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols. Now, so... Notice, it, it means that Paul had a tendency that he will write to them, they will write back to him, he will explain something to them, and they will come back to him, and he will respond to their questions. See, that is how people grow spiritually. You know what is funny? Now, uh, Paul, uh, uh, although it is correct that Paul could have told the Corinthians, hey guys, go and get the efficient letter. But the truth is, when people ask questions, it means their attention is up. It means they are ready to listen. And at that point in time, we, that is when the real education begins. Let me say one more time. It is just a hallmark, a tendency in human beings that when they ask questions, that is when they are really ready to begin to grasp. Uh, Ma, now as a pastor, see, I'm talking about pastor now. See, there are some people that you are not their pastor, but they listen to you. To those people, you might not do this. But to somebody that you are their pastor, you are their trainer, you are the leader of the group, you are the leader of the team. Now, you don't say, ah, well, look, I've tried my best. Though. That time I was, I was teaching, you should have listened. Think about it carefully. Do you suppose Paul will have done an excellent job the first time? Yes. But the Corinthians were now ready. So, and what did Paul do? He answered them. So, 1 Corinthians 8, 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know right that we all have knowledge what does that mean it meant that the corinthians will have told paul say ah paul we all have knowledge you we all have knowledge we know these things and paul is telling them okay we know that we all have knowledge so he's teaching them and they are telling their teacher we have knowledge okay now i want you to see it again it says we all have knowledge and then what did, what did paul do so when he says we all we know that we all have knowledge he is quoting them back to them that it is true that we all have knowledge. So when you guys say we know we all have knowledge, true, we all have knowledge. However, knowledge puffs up. You see that word puffs up there? It's a word that means to inflate. It means to blow something up the way you blow a balloon. In other words, it means that it means to be egocentric, right? So knowledge often drives ego. Knowledge on its own, by itself. So, in other words, Paul is saying, hey guys, it is true that we all have knowledge. However, the way you guys have knowledge is that you don't have knowledge uh, the correct way. Look at it again. Knowledge is beautiful, but how people use knowledge is different. You see, the no see, you two Christians can have the same knowledge, right? But the way they use the knowledge will show their spiritual maturity. An immature person with knowledge will use the knowledge immaturely. Although the knowledge is correct, but the person's grasp, understanding, experience, and use, right, of the knowledge will show the person to be given to, right, uh, spiritual growth or not. Look at it. We know that we all have knowledge. That will be Paul quoting the Corinthians. Paul now responds to them, however, knowledge puffs up. So knowledge, in other words, the knowledge you have is such that puffs a person up. Or you guys have a knowledge in an inflated way. In other words, the, in the very way you are asking your questions and the very way you are going about your life or your use of the knowledge that you have is such that it's a puffing up or it is a bloating up or it is uh, actually blowing something the way you will blow up a balloon. A, a balloon. Uh, yeah. So it, what is it saying? This is it. Go to Galatians. I want you to see what it's talking about. Galatians and chapter 5. 
So Paul is responding to these Corinthians who are busy telling Paul, ah, ah, we all have knowledge now. Where did they get it from? Of course, Paul taught them. And they are now replying that, ah, well, we have knowledge, you have knowledge. And the way, uh, uh, but Paul now addre addresses something important. Galatians 5 and verse 13. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. That's knowledge. That's the knowledge of the work of God in Christ. Right? Our liberty. So, brethren, you have been called unto liberty. You know what? Liberty or the born again thing or salvation, the new birth, the new creation is liberty in itself. It just, it just, it is, it is, uh, it fills God with great joy that he has, he has given a man liberty. Now, he says, now he now says in Galatians 5.13, is that the end? No. It says only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Uh -huh. So knowledge can be used as an occasion to the flesh or knowledge can be used to serve other people. You get the difference now. So the knowledge that the Corinthians possessed was an occasion to the flesh. They used it for an occasion to the flesh. So I can be insisting on the fact, but my manner of insisting at all, my mode or my practice may actually be promoting the flesh. So a man with knowledge, you want to watch his spiritual growth because a man who is immature will take the same spiritual facts and will use it as an occasion to the flesh. What is the problem? Not the liberty, but the man's growth, the man's use of the knowledge. But what did Paul say in Galatians 5.13? But by love, serve one another. In other words, that knowledge or that liberty that you have used as an occasion to the flesh or for selfishness, you could have used it to serve others. Amen. So go back to Romans, I uh, go back to 1 Corinthians and chapter 8. So verse 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge, quoting them, knowledge puffs up. In other words, you guys having knowledge that bloats you up, gets you into ego, gets you egocentric, onto an ego trip, or gets you to be full of yourself, and you cannot consider serving others. So Paul now says, But charity edify it. What does it mean to say charity edify it? It's the same thing as Galatians and chapter 5. Verse 13b. What did he say in verse 13b? It is that, oh, sorry, Galatians 5, 13b. Look at it. Galatians 5, 13b says, by love, serve one another. So 13a corresponds to liberty as an occasion to the flesh. That is knowledge, puffs up. But by love, serve one another. That means charity. Yeah, charity edify it. So what does it mean by charity edify it? Charity or love's edification is to use knowledge to actually serve others. So edification is the purpose of knowledge. Let me say one more time. Knowledge is good, but knowledge should lead to edification. What is edification? How I serve others. What is uh, 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 the flesh? How I serve myself. How I focus on me. That means I turn a truth and I use it to feed selfishness. But instead, it says charity edify it. Or charity, uh, charity, charity's edification will be to serve other people. So my knowledge, the true test of spiritual growth is how I use knowledge. Knowledge is important, but my use of knowledge is how I know whether I am growing or not. You know, some people don't get it. They think that, well, if that guy knows the word, right, that means that that guy is growing spiritually. No, right? A guy that knows the word, good step. Now the use, how he uses what he knows, tells us whether he is growing or not growing. Are you following now? So knowledge, First Corinthians 8.1, knowledge puffs up. That means knowledge can bloat up, can give the person inflated ideas of themselves, for themselves. Everything is about them. The whole local assembly exists for them. Everything that is done there is for them. They are the second born of, the, of God. They are the second one to rise from the dead after Jesus. Everything revolves around them. Selfishness. You know, Paul said, whose God is their belly? That means so there are people that are pursuing uh, uh, selfishness, but are using the gospel to try to do it. So what is the issue? Everything that comes out of, the, of his mouth or her mouth looks like knowledge, and it's not the problem of knowledge. It is the use of knowledge. So knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. Or a man that is developing the love of God will use knowledge to serve others. 
That's the meaning of that figurative expression, charity edified. So you combine 1 Corinthians 8 1 with Galatians 5 13, and you can see that hey, knowledge pops up simply means you use the knowledge or the liberty you have for your own good, excluding others, not caring about others or giving a hoot about them. So somebody said, but what that guy says is correct. Correct. It's true. A person can say a correct thing and use it incorrectly. Did you get that? A man can be correct, yeah, in the fact he states, but the use of the facts can be incorrect. At that point, Paul would then end up saying such a man is going to sin against the brethren. What he's saying is factual. What he's saying actually does not disagree with the gospel, but the practice or the use of what is said can then bring about the loss or lack of, or, or, yeah, or, of edification. Are you following now? So again, I'm going to say it one more time. Uh, uh, in the day and the age in which we live, the knowledge of the word of God is profoundly important. It's critical. It's the starting point. It's not the end. It's the starting point. It tells me you are on a journey that is spiritual, right? But the knowledge is not the be all end all. The use of the knowledge tells us a lot about you. So a man, right, can have the right knowledge and use it the wrong way. What, what is wrong? Not the knowledge, but the man's use. What has happened? The man's use tells us where the man really is at. So a man can say the same thing that a much more uh, mature man says. And they are both saying the same thing, but their use is different. And in their use, you can pinpoint their growth. Amen. So first Corinthians 8 1. But look at it one more time. Uh, as a pastor, as a leader of men, as a teacher, apostle, prophet, evangelist, whatever you call yourself, as a leader of men in the local assembly, be ready that after you've sweated and you've poured out your explanations, the saints must ask, ask questions, will ask questions, at which point we don't tell them, go away. No, we answer, we acknowledge, A. Hey, that's good, ask questions, and then we answer to them, we respond to them, praise God. Now, look, you see, in this section of the Bible, I want you to see something. Paul is yeah, responding to the people that are asking him questions. And he's now helping them say that it is true you have knowledge. However, in your knowledge, you need to observe your use. You know what they're trying to tell Paul is, uh-uh. Uh, um, look, look at verse 2. If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. So there is a ought to know. There is a knowing things as we ought to. So there is knowing, there is knowledge, and there is a knowing as we ought to, which is charity edifying. How do we ought to use knowledge? We ought to use it to edify others. That means what is at the back of our mind in our knowledge of redemption, knowledge of Christ, knowledge of our liberty, knowledge of what he has done in us and who we are in him is how we will use it to edify others. When others are missing in my knowledge, my knowledge is actually suspect. The knowledge is correct. My use of it is suspect. What do I then do? I press into knowing as I ought to know. Praise God. I press into knowing as I ought to know. I, I, very, very important. Knowing as I ought to know. It says here in verse 4, as, touch, as concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. That's what the Corinthians are telling Paul. And Paul is not it's agreeing. We know an idol is not in the world. So what is he repeating? The knowledge that pops up. We know an idol is not in the world. And that there is none other God but one. Right? So Paul is saying, I agree with you. We know an idol is nothing. We know that there is no other God but one. Right? Now, he says in verse 5, For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, we in him, one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Paul now says, I agree with you guys. Verse 7, I'll be it. There is not in every man that knowledge. That means not all the saints in Corinth that I have taught know that fact. Yeah, it says there are still some with the conscience of the idol. Yeah, unto this hour, they eat it as a thing offered unto idols. So they have practiced so much idolatry that whenever they see food offered to idols, they begin to think about, uh, they, uh, they associate it with the practice of idolatry or idol worship all over again. And it says, for those people, their conscience, being weak, is defiled. What is defiling it? That association in their mind, right? They are, they are still associating things that way. So Paul is saying, now see, before Paul says, I'll be it, 
I want you to go to the 10. So you can see the kind of people Paul is talking to. First Corinthians 10 and verse 15. He says, I speak, or look at verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. What does Paul tell the Corinthians to do? Flee from idolatry. But why? Watch carefully. He says in verse 15, I am speaking to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Somebody says, no, 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 no. You are not meant to judge what your pastor says. Paul said, judge what I say. Judge what... So saints are meant to be taught properly, and then they are to judge what they are taught. Now, a pastor doesn't say, look, I am so correct that whatever I say, accept it that way. Just take it. Yeah? I have done all the study for you. And because I've done all the study, all you need to do is just open your mouth like a day old chicken and accept it because I said it so. Ah, my friend, no. Paul, who we read, or at least who I read, says to people that he wrote to, right? In fact, look, I want you to see, I'm going to read that passion to you in the Passion Translation, 1 Corinthians 10, 15. I know I am writing to thoughtful people. To whom did Paul write? Thoughtful people. Say, I am writing to people that have their head correct. He says, so carefully consider what I say. What do you tell them to do? Carefully consider. What am I meant to do? The greatest honor I can give to my pastor is to carefully consider. I give it my attention. I carefully weigh it. I consider it thoughtfully. Right? Now, believers are thinking people. The greatest service that can happen to you in the local church is that you are taught to think. Now, believers that don't think might be taught the Pauline epistles, but in an unpauline way. The Pauline epistles or Paul's slants, yeah, is for people to thoughtfully consider. Yeah? Now, uh, in, in fact, look at what the message says. I assume I'm addressing believers now who are mature. Draw your own conclusions. It says draw your... So believers are to think. And in thinking, they are to draw conclusions. And you want them to think like, uh, uh, like they've been taught. Amen. It says draw. Let, let me read it for you in the J.B. Phillips. Yeah, J.B. Phillips. It says the lesson... He says, I am speaking to you as intelligent men. Think over what I'm saying. Think over what I'm saying. See, may you not be found yeah, propagating that saints should not think about what they are taught in the local assembly. No, the believer must think. The greatest gift that we open men to all over again in the scriptures is the power, the ability, the freedom, right, to think again. And what are men supposed to do to think as intelligent men? Oh, somebody says, no, 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 I don't like intelligent Christians. My dear friend, don't be an idolater. An idolater. Don't be like, a, you know, I don't know about you. We are not like shamans or magicians. It's magicians that don't require people to be intelligent. No, we are the sons of God, ministers of Christ. We, we preach the gospel with all our hearts, with all our might, with everything in us. So we speak to men anticipating that they are intelligent. And one of the hallmarks of intelligent people is they will think about what you tell them. They will come back with questions. Even in the framing of their questions, you will see that, uh-huh, you will think in person. He says, I am speaking to you as unto intelligent men. You know, increasingly today, in these days, yeah, in the 21st century, I am listening to ministers, right, pastors, right, that tell their congregation, I don't like intelligent men. I don't want you to think. I don't, don't, don't think. Just pastor has said it. He has studied. Take it that way. Just take it. No. No. That is the major thing, the big thing that separates Christianity from idolatry. Right? Idolatry is, that's the way it is. Just nod your head, say four times, 60 times, and it's done. No. In Christianity, people think over what the minister is saying. They ponder. They give themselves to it. He says, I'm speaking to you as unto intelligent men. So Paul wrote his Corinthian letters anticipating that the Corinthians must be intelligent. See, I don't know about you. I personally, it would be the greatest disgrace of my life if I minister to Christians that don't know how to think. You see, in the very way that we talk, teach, in the extensive, copious way that we go about scripture, we are trying to tell you that the glory of God is for men to think, right? The glory of God, we are to ponder, to think, we are to meditate, to mull over. Oh, somebody says, no, no, don't meditate. Or if you meditate, it means just, just say what your pastor has said. No, 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 no. You ponder, you think, you dwell upon. 
Look, you dwell. Why? Because it is in the sweating over the thinking. It is in the pondering over what you have heard that your growth occurs. Your growth does not occur in gaining the knowledge. That's the point I'm saying. Your growth occurs in the use. Your growth occurs in the practice of the word. Your growth occurs in giving attention, your focus, your energy, all your absorbing energies to what you've heard. So if, so let me give you an example. Let's say you listen to me tonight and be, uh, until tomorrow, you don't do any thinking on what you've heard. I doubt that you know what you think you know. Or according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, you, do, you will not know as you ought to. How do we come to know as we ought to with the spiritual growth? The way we come to know as we ought to is that we recognize that there's an intelligence in the communication of the word of God and that we are to think over what we have been told. That's the J.B. Phillips. Now, look at NIV. First Corinthians, and chapter 10, and verse 15. How oh, someone say, Paul is it really important for Christians to think? It is. Why? That is the lesson we learn in the apostles. Right, First Corinthians 10, 15. NIV says, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. I speak to sensible. So believers are to be sensible. Anytime you come to the local assembly and it, you are taught or you are told or it's implied or you think that you shouldn't think, you are not far from idolatry. The hallmark of idolatry is that the men that speak it are dumb. The people that are spoken to are dumb. The idols that have been spoken about are dumb. But, but no, in Christ Jesus, Jesus is made unto us wisdom. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in him. Why? For us to ponder, to think, to upon. Look at Acts. Glory to God. I want you to consider this because it's very important. It's very, very important. I want you to go to Acts and chapter 17. Acts 17. Very important. Acts 17. You see, because if you don't get this fact, you, you might fail to appreciate the way that the apostles went about, yeah, the things that they went about. Now, Acts 17, I'm reading from the NIV, right, from verse 2. It says, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He reasoned. So, since I reasoned, I expect that the people listening to me must reason too. I cannot do your reasoning for you. I only show you an example in my teaching that you have to reason. Then you, you, what did Paul do? He reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. Amen. What did he do? He reasoned, explaining and proving. What is the purpose of teaching? The purpose of a teaching ministry is to train the believers in reasoning like God. You see, the word of God, the scripture itself, is the mind of a spirit given to the mind of man that the mind of man might learn to think like the spirit. Let me say that one more time. The purpose of a teaching ministry is to trigger or to encourage men, right, uh, it, by explaining to them the word of God as the mind of a spirit. And it is then proclaimed to the mind of the hearer so that the mind of man can learn to think like the spirit. So God's word is the tool that God has given to the saint so that the saint can train his mind in thinking spiritually. Praise God. When men do not think, when men abandon thinking or outsource thinking, we are not far from idolatry or idol worship. We're not far from it. No, Christianity awakens a man to the logic of God. In fact, it is, Jesus is the logos, the logic of God. So God's logic is, uh, is made apparent to our minds that we might reason in the scriptures. Our, our instructors are meant to reason, and in their reasoning, we are meant to learn how to reason, and then we go back and we reason the scripture. Look at Acts, that's in Acts 17. Acts 17. It says in verse uh, 10, as soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea, on arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness. How do you receive the word of God? Eagerly. You don't yawn or sleep. If you're feeling sleepy, you stand up, right? You say, with great eagerness and examined. Glory to God. See what Luke recognized in the Bereans, what he called noble character, right? The nobility of saints is in their receiving the word with eagerness. See, I don't accept the word when you preach it and I end it there. No, I'm going to examine the scriptures myself too. So he says they examine the scriptures every day. No, somebody says, well, a young Christian cannot examine scripture. My dear friend, the people in Berea were not even believers. 
They were unbelievers. If unbelievers can listen to a man of God and they can go back to examine the scriptures every day, then the youngest believer, right, has the ability as a human being to examine rigorously, to think and to ponder upon the scriptures day and night. Amen. No, somebody says, well, I am your teacher and you are a new convert. You don't know how to think. No, you are just told that guy that is an imbecile. No, no belief, no human being should be, should be treated like an imbecile, right? If God has given to man something in the mind and intelligence and ability to take facts, to ponder it, to turn it upon. If that is not so, no man can get born again. Because for a man to get born again, he doesn't open his mind like a day old chicken. He is told things. He turns it in his mind. And then he accepts it. In accepting it, he says he agrees or he believes. Amen. Let me say one more time. Now, Acts 17, 11. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message. So can an unbeliever receive the word? Yes. Yeah? How? Oh, with great eagerness. They were, not, they were not Christians, but they received it with great eagerness. <laughs> that is what well-mannered people do. So we just train men. Have good manners. Don't scream when the word of God is being taught. Listen well. Pay attention to the details. It says, great eagerness and examine the scriptures. My dear friends, who are those that examine the scriptures? It was Berean Jews in a Jewish synagogue listening to Paul, a new creation man, teach them the Bible, the new creation way. And Paul didn't tell them, uh, 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 who are you? I thought, and you think and go home and examine. What, what are you examining? Do you know the Greek of the Hebrew of the Aramaic? Do you know the Irish of the Scot of the Russian? No. They examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, verse 12, as a result, many of them believed. How did they arrive at believing? By examining the scriptures every day. No, somebody says, well, that is because you are not Christians. That the Christian is not meant to examine, to see if it's true. The Christian should just say, well, my pastor said it, I accept it that way. No, that will make you a gullible fellow. That will make you uh, like a day-old chicken. In fact, worse than a day-old chicken. You know, there are so many Christians, spineless, having no spine, having no boldness, having no certainty, uh, not able to use their mind, fickle guys unable to go about and stand on their two feet and use that brain you say jesus did not wash our brain away he did not wash our thinking away so say pastor why are you taking it this way because the last resort of our humanity the last vestiges that separates us from chickens and goats and rams and lions and and and, and elephants and monkeys is our ability to ponder on what we've been told to turn it up in our minds to examine it you see, in science, they call it metastating. So you can state and you can metastate. You can think on your thoughts. That's what makes a human being a human being. A man that will not think, that will refuse to ponder, that will refuse to consider, that will refuse to be intelligent. That kind of man is, no, is nothing different other than a demon. Demons hear things and they tremble. Men, when they hear, they ponder. They think. Hallelujah. It, this is important. You know, if you are a leader listening to me tonight, the greatest gift you could give to your congregation is to raise men that will reason, that will think, that will ponder, that will mull upon stuff, or that will give you their attention. They'll be absorbed in it. They will turn it over in their minds. Otherwise, we are no different from people that are in idolatry or in idol worship because it's idols that are dumb. It is, the, it is those that worship idols that are dumb. No lifeless, not able to think, to ponder, to reason. But Christians or people, see, whenever the Bible is open to people, there's something that awakens in them, an eagerness to ponder, an eagerness to think. All of a sudden, the pathways of reasoning start getting formed. Amen. What is the difference between the man that has not heard the gospel and the man that has heard the gospel? The man that has heard the gospel has had light given to him. And it does something to your mind. There's no denying it. When you come in contact with the word of God, it does something to your mind. Oh, no, somebody says, no, I just absorbed the word of God in my spirit. Lie to yourself. No, the Bible was not given for the purpose of our spirits. The Bible was given to communicate our spirits to our soul. The Bible was given to communicate our spirits to our mind. We are to use spirit facts, word facts, gospel facts, right? Prophetic facts, yeah, mosaic facts, but yeah, Pauline facts to renew the mind. How are we going to renew the mind? We are going to examine. We are going to give it attention. We are going to pay attention to it. Amen. We are going to pay attention. Look at it. I want you to see something. Yeah. Look at Titus. Titus and chapter 
Titus and chapter, um, Titus and chapter, before I go to Titus, <laughs> I want to read that NIV to you in another translation. You know, let me tell you why we are addressing this. Increasingly in our day, for some weird reason, there are men, ministers, there are leaders that are telling the saints, don't reason. Yeah, take it the way I give it to you. No, 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 no. You see, the sages, the men that have gone ahead of us, they will tell you, you pay attention, you listen, and then don't let anybody do your thinking for you. Praise God. Don't let, see the saints should say amen to that. Don't let anybody do your thinking for you. When people do your thinking for you and you don't do your own thinking before long, you'll be a candidate for deception. In fact, your baptismal name will be deception. In fact, we can call you brother deceit or sister deceit. Why? Because even unbelievers in Berea, people that were not yet Christians, they were not yet saints, they received the word of God eagerly. How do we know they were eager? They actually examined what they were told to find out if it is so. Oh, see, let me tell you, if, think about it carefully, why is it that as I'm teaching, you are looking at your Bible? It is because you are not just meant to say, Seku says it, I accept it, that settles it. <laughs> no, no. See, if Seku says it settles it for you, then you are not meant to have a Bible. You don't say, well, I'm going to come at 8 p.m. the next day, and I'm going to open my mouth like a day old chicken and say, preacher on preacher. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to put a, a tube and pass it into my heart and then say, okay, play it. And don't say, whatever the minister says, I don't, I don't put any thought blinker on it. I just take it that way. No, no. See, listen actively. Don't be a passive listener. Listen actively. Listen, see, I, I don't know about you. You know, the, the uh, Paul said, he, like I said, 1 Corinthians 10, 15, I am writing to sensible men. He called the Corinthians sensible. He said, I am appealing to your sensibility that you are going to uh, uh, consider these things like intelligent men. Let me tell you again. There, will have, there is no revival. There is no spiritual growth. There is no increase in spiritual understanding if all of us, if what all of us did is that what was told to us 50 years ago was all we accepted. If all what was told to us 30, 100, 200 years ago was all we accepted, we will still be in the dark ages. Why? It will be, uh, in fact, what, is, what, is the, what does it mean to be the protestant? What is Martin Luther? A man that picked the word of God and began to think upon it. And then he put some thoughts, he put some questions out for the establishment of his day that they were angry about. And that, too, that is how the knowledge of the, or that is how the church got a recovery of a truth that had been buried. How did it get buried? Because the priest stopped teaching the people truth. The, it, the truth did not leave the Bible, but the priest just stopped teaching it until the Martin Luther's yeah, and the other guys got up. And they began to proclaim what the word of God has always proclaimed. But how did they get there? The word didn't change. Their mind changed. They began to think, to reason, to dwell upon, to ponder, yeah, upon what they have been told. And so we see it in this Acts 17. Acts 17 and verse 2. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on, the, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. You go all the way down. Yeah, it says in verse 11, now the Bereans were Jews who are more of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message. What did they receive? The message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures. Stop. Think about it. What scriptures did they examine? They can only examine what Paul had showed to them before. So that means when they were there, they took notes. We don't take notes so as to say, I haven't taken the note, that's the end. No, you take notes to use it as fodder or to use it as input to your thoughts later when you're alone. What happens when you have questions? The Lord help you, you have the pastor that answers questions. And unhappy are you if your pastor tells you, ah, I thought and you are questioning. <laughs> then you're in trouble, you are in trouble. But look at Paul again, look at Paul, look at Paul. I wanted to say this because it's extremely important. Christian thought and philosophy is extremely important. Now, because there are Christians today that think or believe that Christians are not meant to think upon these things. You know, but the Bereans, Bereans, they were not even born again yet, but they could search the scriptures. And I tell you, if a Berean, 
a man not born again can search the scriptures, so can you, so should you, so must you. It will be a travesty of justice. It will be actually a disgrace to the resurrection of Jesus. If you, a believer, suspend or outsource your thinking, no, it is demons that when they hear, they tremble. No, a believer, when you hear, you ponder, you think on these things. You think on these things. You give your absorbing energies. A believer is a thinking man. A believer is a thinking man. Men are meant to think. You're a man. You're not an animal. You're a man. The joy of any, any minister is that you raise men that can think. Hallelujah. Look, look at Galatians. Galatians. Galatians and chapter 2. Galatians 2, verse 11. My famous P Peter and Paul thing again. When Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Look at it. When Peter, which Peter was come to Antioch? Go to the beginning of chapter 2. Verse 1. 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. And I went by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation. Privately to them that were what? Reputation, right? Privately to them that were of reputation. Who are these ones of reputation? Jump to verse 9. And when James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars. So we now know those of reputation in verse uh, 2 will have been Peter, James, and John. So Paul brought his message. And he asked Peter, James, and John to vet it. Right? Now, he said, lest by any means I should run or I run in vain. That means Peter, New Paul's message. James, New Paul's message. John, New Paul's message. What they did with it, though, that's a different thing. But they knew it. Right? Why? They were students of Jesus, giving themselves to the world. Now, anyway, look at verse 3. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled. To be circumcised. So in other words, Peter, James, and John understood the preaching of Paul so well, or knew the truth of the gospel so well, they knew that uh -uh, there is nothing in the gospel that demands that Titus be circumcised for salvation. Now, look at verse 4. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Verse 5, for those kind of people, it says, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, 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 not for an hour that the fruit of the gospel might continue with you. So Paul is saying, James knows the gospel. John knows the gospel. Peter knows the gospel, right? And they did not ask that Titus be compelled to be circumcised. Now, go to verse 11. So that same Peter, who knows the gospel and knows it well, he now said, verse 11, the Galatians 2, 11, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Stop. Did Peter know the gospel? Yes. Who vetted Paul's message? Peter. If Peter and James and John did not agree with what Paul was preaching, the church would not have made the scripture. Sincerely. So when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Now, it goes on and on. It says, before Satan came from James, see, which James? That same James. Right? James that knows the truth. James' boys came and they acted contrary to the truth that James knew. He said he did it. That means Peter. He did it with the Gentiles. But when they were come, that means when James' boys came, James that knows the truth, his boys came. Now I'm, now I'm telling you that, see, as a believer, you must be able to separate between knowledge and how people use knowledge. Do not be hoodwinked or do not be like a day old chicken saying, well, if what that person says agrees with scripture, then every way the person uses it must be scriptural. No. A person can take scripture and be speaking scripture and be speaking truth and the use of it is to bring men into bondage. It's to propagate tribes, tribalism, nepotism, to, tri to, to propagate all sorts, right? Emotions and feelings, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, but we don't do that. We don't do that, right? James was a pillar. Peter was a pillar. By the time that uh, James and Peter and John started preaching, Paul was still in his nappy. In fact, he had no nappy. He was a sinner, a stark sinner, illiterate Paul. Now, it says in verse 12, for before the Satan came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them. 
So those guys came. Peter must know that James's boys are political. You know, it's very funny. You, you don't know politics until you've seen church politics. You know, can people be given to the gospel and politics? You better bet, right? James's boys were ministers, gospel guys. But what were they coming to do? They were coming to take, remember? He says some people entered in on a ways and they were coming in verse five, right? Or verse four, to take people into bondage. Bondage to what? The traditions of the elders. When we, so imagine, see, let me give you an idea. So let's say that I talk about what the word of God talks about. You know, something is very funny, right? I can take a Bible word and talk about it from the traditions of my fathers. I can take a Bible word. So somebody says, uh, this word, let me give you an example. The, the tradition in which I was born, my father, if you had met my father, my earthly father, yeah, if I ever met him, you wouldn't doubt. The man had tiger marks, yeah, tiger marks, yeah, tiger marks. Tigers didn't do it, yeah, he, he had tiger marks, yeah. The Greek word is the word pele. <laughs> Wait, it's, you won't find it in your Greek dictionary. It just means a tribal mark that is used to, uh, to demarcate one household from another, right? So the man, yeah, in where my father came from, if you wake up in the morning and you want to greet your grandpa, you go on the X axis. You know X axis? Yeah, that is the line where Y is zero. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's that is you are parallel on the floor. Your jaw is touching the floor. Your chest is hugging the ground. Right? You are parallel. Right? Uh, in the tradition I come from, you don't look at your uncle and say Matthew. Mm -mm. Your uncle is. Uh, yeah, you call your uncle the way you call your grandfather, right? Now, but what if I now go among the English and I'm preaching the gospel? What do I preach? I don't preach what my uncle wants. I don't preach what my tiger mark father wants. I don't preach what my grandma wants. I don't even preach what the people of England want. I preach that uncompromised truth of the gospel. You know, I can take, let me say it again. I want you to think. I can take Bible words and I am teaching you the traditions of my fathers and you won't know. No, what do we do? The church of God is a tribe on its own. The church of God is a nation on its own. How will you know? Well, you have to open your mind and open your eyes like, like Paul. So look at it again. Let's read Galatians 2, 5 again. So Paul, in verse 1, Galatians 2, verse 1, Paul, 14 years after, went to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, he meant the elders, the big boys, the pillars, Peter, James, and John. Yeah, Paul was not a pillar. Paul was a man that came to the pillars, <laughs> right? Now, but, so the pillars were Peter, James, and John. And then there were their boys. Yeah, which some of which uh, Paul then says they are false brethren. Verse 4 it says, false brethren on our ways were brought in. You ask, who smuggled them in? I don't know. Do these things happen in the church? They do happen. Who came in privily to spy out our liberty? So there are men or women that will appear to be talking liberty, but what they are saying in the name of liberty is bondage. How will you know? You listen. You listen well, you think, you ponder, you examine, you give it all your attention. So what did Paul do? He says, ah, these guys are talking about the liberty that we have in Christ Jesus. They really are, I haven't listened to these guys. Mm -mm. This is bondage. This is not liberty. So what did Paul then do? To verse 5, Galatians 2, 5. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. What did Paul not say? Ah, we're in Jerusalem. We, we, are in the, we are in the territory of Peter, James, and John. So these are the fathers. Whatever they say, who clan and sinker, I take it in. No. We give men our attention. We give men our focus. Every man is worthy to be listened to. But not every man, right, must be listened to without judging it. There is no man, actually. You are to ponder. So we give men attention. We are not intolerant. But I haven't listened to them. You see, it is up to me what I do, what I hear. The Bible says, take it what you hear and take it how you hear. That's the teaching of Jesus. What did Jesus then, what, I said Jesus, what did Paul then do? To whom, Galatians 2, 5, we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. Why? Now the truth of the gospel might continue. Amen. So people can speak, spew, say, mention, declare, right? fruits or knowledge, but the knowledge is couched 
or communicated right in ways that is nothing other than bondage how will you know you are going to have to think now go back down to verse uh 11 notice that paul didn't say well because peter is there i'm going to say peter should do my thinking for me no peter was there john was there james was there these guys that were brought in on our ways we don't know who brought them in but they were brought in yeah we don't care who brought them in what we are what we care about so somebody says ah that thing you are talking about, who said it? No, don't be, don't be concerned with who said it. Be concerned with, is it the word of God? That's your starting position. If you start with who said it, you'll soon be in trouble. Verse 11, when Peter was come to Antioch, I wish to him to the face. See, if Paul was a, ah, 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 he's Peter, I'm, then what's going to happen? Paul is not going to withstand him to the face. And Paul said, hey, Peter is to be blamed. And notice in that, in that old episode, Peter did not want to say, I am not to be blamed. I don't know about you, I love Peter. I want to grow up to be a man like Peter, right? I want to grow up to be a man like Peter. That somebody who was in spiritual nappies when I started preaching the gospel, who, was, who is a disciple of a disciple of my disciples, is able to call me to order and my love for the truth will determine that I don't say, uh -uh, and who are you? What gives you the boldness? Uh -uh. What gives a man the boldness is the truth of the gospel. That is the only thing that makes Christianity to, have, to be the viral force that it is. Otherwise, we are going to soon have the shackles of the ancient tribes, the shackles that has kept in bondage all civilizations and has shut the eyes, the ears, the thinking faculties of men down through the ages. But not so the people of God. Galatians 2.11, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Yeah, so Paul thought about what Peter was doing and he came to the conclusion. Now, that tells you Paul is not the type of person that will say, ah, that is, that is Pilar Peter. Wait, does Paul take Peter to be a man of repute? Yes. Yes. Look at verse, I want you to see it again. It says in verse 2, yeah, as it says privately, I preached to them that were of reputation. So Peter had a hard end reputation. So we're not talking about just taking people anyhow. No, let me say it again. We honor men because God Himself became a man. In our honor for men, we take what God said in Christ Jesus and we use it to judge what any other man says, including ourselves. So I don't tell myself, well. Because I was the one that said it two years ago, it must be correct. No, who am I? Paul would say, and who is Paul? And who is Apollos? But men by whom you believed. So verse 11, Galatians 2, 11, when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to the face. What was that thing that entered into Paul that made him withstand Peter to the face and he lived to tell the story? You see, that thing that made him withstand Peter to the face is that wisdom. Somebody will say, well, uh, it is not wisdom to withstand. It is wisdom to withstand, to the face. Because before long, we will be in bondage. In bondage to personalities. In bondage to those that have come to spy on our liberty. In bondage to brothers that are actually preaching what looks like brotherhood, sounds like brotherhood, but is the bondage of brotherhood. No. But what do we do? See, remember this. Paul is in all of Paul's letters. There are men whose God is their belly. There are men whose mouth must be stopped. There are men who do not care about that liberty that we have brought in Christ. God's uncles, always wanting to shackle those for whom Christ died. No, we don't do that. We, we magnify. We, we are actually glamorously uh, um, emphatic about the rightness, the glory, the grandeur, the power of what Jesus did in the new creation. If it's enough for Jesus, it's enough for me. It must be enough for you. What is the greatest service you could do to me, especially as I teach? Be a thinking man. Be a thinking man. Be a reasoning man. Be a man that will reason from scriptures, that will examine it to say, is it so? And if it's not so, call me up. Chat me up. Come to me. And well, if, you are, if I'm not pastoring you, right, I may not give you all the attention, right? But if I am pastoring you or will be develop a relationship, then we will talk. You see, when you expect men to listen to you, then you must expect to listen to men too. When men come back to us with their disagreement with what we have said, we don't say, ah, uh -uh. <laughs> was I not the one that taught you even how to look at the concordance? Ah, look, look, look at the effrontery that has overcome you. That's pride. That's pride. That's nothing more than, no, somebody says, no, no, Pastor Seku, you don't understand. I, 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 these people, they have wings. No, it's the pastor that has wings that cannot be questioned. Even God can be questioned. 
You know, when a man cannot be questioned, he is higher than God because the God of all the earth can be questioned. People question Jesus in his earthly walk. So God is questionable, can be questioned. And so there are men, unlike God, right? They cannot be questioned. We are not such. You mustn't be such. You, you cannot say that you listen to the gospel to a point where men cannot ask you a question. Paul, at the whole of the Corinthians letter, it will say now, concerning what you wrote unto me, I will now answer. Concerning, 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 concerning. See, that is the example we see in Paul. In, in fact, you, you know, <laughs> Jesus taught for 40 days in Acts 1. After teaching for 40 days, the disciple says, ah, will you at this time <laughs> give the kingdom to... I mean, you know, sometimes when you teach, people say baffling things. But you know what Jesus did? He just continued to teach. You shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost comes, you just continue to teach. So when men ask questions, even if the questions look foolish, the beauty of the Christian work, the power of our risen Lord, the example in the apostles, the meaning of the epistles, is that we then find a way to set them on the straight and narrow path by answering their questions with all candor, with all power, with all boldness, with all clarity. Because one day, you don't know. We see, the teacher cannot determine the day the student will learn, but the student knows when he's ready. So what do we do? We preach the word in season and out of season. If you're a man committed to the gospel of Christ, you have to be a lover of men. And look, you've not been wearied before until men weary you. Moreover, you weary men too. So, hey, welcome to the club. Galatians 2.11, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Right? Paul, uh, let me tell you what that means. It means that Paul was not a yes man. A local assembly is not the assembly of yes men. The local assembly is an assembly of men taught to reason in the scriptures, to honorably listen to their pastor, to go home and ponder and think on what they've heard, and to come back and to act as uh, in line with the word of God. In this case, Peter was acting somehow. Then Paul said, I wish to him to the face. Somebody was in, see in our day they would say ah uh, men would say no 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 you can't who are you you can't withstand we can you can't withstand Peter who are you they would, those kind of guys would be like James or John is men can withstand him but no this Peter dragged himself into a local assembly I don't know about you if Peter was preaching on Skype then that is Peter's problem but when preacher uh, uh, Peter drags himself into our local assembly then he has made himself that are available to us. So in our local assembly, we respond to him. Oh no, let me say what I've said again. You get a tape by a man of God. That man of God preaches somewhere. He wasn't even talking to you. You don't know the context, leave it that way. Somebody comes in, somebody standing in front of you. You can see with your eyes. You've listened to the gospel from them. You know their context. You are listening to what they are saying. To that kind of man. See, Paul knew Peter well. He knew that, ah, uh, ah, uh, Peter, this one you are doing. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So what did he do? He will stood him to the face. Now, look at it. Look at what Peter, Paul observed for verse 12. For before the Satan came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, when James' boys were come, he withdrew and separated himself. You know, I don't know about you. Christianity is not the practice of James' boys. You know, I, I don't know about you. Uh, today, we see men. You know, let me give you an example. Let's say, let's say something happens on Twitter or on Instagram. I don't expect any member of Grace Place to then say, ah, I'm going to defend my pastor. And then you all then descend upon that fellow or that woman. Uh, and then you all attack. We're not dogs. We're not guard dogs. We're not attack dogs. That person we're attacking is a brother. There is a brotherly way to engage brothers. There is a sisterly way to engage brothers. There is a brotherly way to engage sis uh, sisters too. You get it now. See, let me say it again. We are brethren. The revelation, the reality of brotherhood, right, will make, will, will temper the way we go after each other. So look at it again. Notice that Paul didn't say, all of you that are with me, follow me now. And say, oh, well, uh, Peter, we, the, we, me and the boys behind me, we are against you. No. Paul stood up. We stood him to the face. Did it matter to Paul whether everybody agreed with him or not? No. Was he out to embarrass Peter? No. He already said Peter was a pillar. He already said Peter was a man of influence. He himself needed the influence of Peter to validate him. So Paul is not against Peter. We must not do our Bible narrative in uh, using uh, a humanistic perspective. 
You know, sometimes we teach the Bible as though it is the cabal or it, as though it is the mafia, the mafiosi. No, we are not guard dogs. We are not attack dogs. We are brethren. And so, see, Paul went up to Peter. Why did he go up to Peter? To withstand him. You see, notice, Paul already, is that the first time Paul is withstanding? No. Go to verse, uh, go to verse 5. Some people wanted to put people in bondage in verse 4. Paul said, uh-uh, we did not give them any space by subjection. No, not for an hour. Not for an hour. It didn't give. So Paul, it's not that Paul said, eh, hmm, I, have, I have it in mind to deal with this Peter. No. It just happened to be that Peter had now come and he was now costing divisions in Antioch. Remember, Peter came to Antioch. Please read it again. Read it in the Greek or the Aramaic, any language you like. Peter is Paul's senior any day. Peter has started ministry when Paul didn't know Paul, when Paul would not even recognize Paul in epistle. <laughs> right? But when on account of the truth, Peter, right? Peter knew he was wrong. Look at it again. He said, because he was to be blamed. Look at verse 12. For before the sudden came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Can you see now? Can you see the trouble is circumcision? Although, although Peter did not compel Titus to be circumcised. Right? In verse 3. He says, but neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. All of a sudden, the chief circumcision officers were now come to uh were now come to Antioch and Peter, mighty Peter, right? Influential Peter was afraid. He says, all, verse 13, other Jews dissembled likewise with him, in so much that Barnabas, Barnabas, Pastor, Pastor Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. That, that Greek word means they are acting, they were acting like Hollywood actors. Film trick. Now, verse 14. When I saw, amen. When I did what? When I saw. Now, look at that word carefully. What does that word mean? That word, when I saw. That word, see. Yeah? When I saw. Right? I, I want to tell you because I want you to pay close attention. So, when Peter was with Paul in that town, what was Paul doing in Peter's presence? It says, when I saw Galatians and chapter 2 and verse 14. If you have your concordance, bring it out. Right? Check it again. This is what Paul did. Paul, the man that will reason from scripture. You know, let me tell you. If you are given to reasoning from scripture, it means you are telling the saints they should reason about everything in the local assembly. Because the local assembly is the theater of scripture. Galatians and chapter 2 and verse 14. Ah, well, somebody says, well, I, I'm Peter. And because I'm Peter, you can reason about anything, but not about mine. Look at it again. Galatians 2, 14. Right? It says, when I saw, when I saw, that word saw, or that word translates saw there. Yeah? Let me tell you what the Greek word means. It's a word that means, yeah, uh, I perceived, I designed, I discovered, I paid attention, yeah? I, I inspected, I examined. Look at that. So what was Paul doing? Yeah, in fact, the, another transition means to have an interview with. So Paul was interviewing Peter in his mind. Paul was interrogating Peter's action in the light of the truth of the gospel. He was inspecting it. He was examining it. He was ascertaining what must be done. In other words, Paul is looking at Peter and is like, what must be done about this? In other words, Paul is not saying, well, if Peter is doing it, I must follow suit. No. In between our leaders doing something and we following suit is that we must examine, we must ponder, we must pay attention, we must observe, we must design, we must discover, we must notice, we must perceive, we must interview it in our minds. Amen. We must interview it in our minds. We must understand it. Right? We, we must actually be skilled. That's what the word means. There was, it, it says, when I skillfully designed. So in other words, Galatians 2.14 tells us that Paul's practice is no matter who is in front of him, he will open the gates of discernment, which is a function of proper thorough analysis in line with the known truth of the gospel, which will not bring saints into bondage. So look at verse 14. When I saw 
when I analyzed, thought about it, discerned, right, pondered, that they walk not uprightly. Someone say, eh? That thing that makes you say, my pastor was not right. May he live your life. Are you to say amen? No. It, what you say is, what will make you say your pastor was not right? When your pastor is right, that one is, that one is actually uh, uh, a, a case of pride. But somebody says just blankly, what will make you say your pastor is not correct? That means your pastor has done a good job. Can't you see? Peter validated Paul. Paul got so bold. After that, it then we stood Peter. Why? I saw. I discerned. I understood. I, I could see clearly that they walk not uprightly. Why? Pastor of the church has gone on holiday. Barnabas. Imagine. Paul said, even Barnabas. In so much that Barnabas. You could see that he pained Paul. In the local assembly, my dear friends, you should be that leader, you be that believer, you should be that saint, that Christian. You see, you don't need a title, you don't need to be called reverend, senior professor, and apostle, you don't need to be called evangelist or anything. You just need to be one for whom Christ died, who contends earnestly for the faith delivered to the saints, a man believing in the gospel of God, a, a man given to the study of the word night and day, a disciple, a disciplined follower. That's all you need to be. Have your eyes open, your mind open to the truth of God's word. And what did he do? He says, I, he says, I saw that they walked not uprightly according to. He didn't say, hey, well, our own style in the country I come from, that I said, no, 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 no. no. See, the Greeks might do it different from the Russians. Then what are we going to do? Not the Greeks, not the Russians. We follow the method of the church of God. Hallelujah. So when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I, I don't know about you, you see. You know, I was telling you about my, my papa. Right? He has this, uh, uh, you know, travel max. Where my mama comes from, uh, actually they are both from uh, the similar tribe. In that tribe, the elder is always right. It is rightness by age. The elder is right, and the elder never tells the younger, I was wrong. And they have one strange way of trying to do it. Yeah? <laughs> and so you never find men and women that carry that tribal slant into the church and say, well, when you are greeting me, you must kneel down. <laughs> Is it not ridiculous? As a pastor, I, I have, I'm, uh, no, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't. It's, that will be walking not uprightly. You know, like we were teaching yesterday, that will be Matthew 15 territory, teaching the commandments of man for the doctrine of Christ, for the commandment of God. And the Bible calls that hypocrisy. Yeah, now let me say it again. Galatians 2.14. See, we live in a day. We live in an hour that men must contend earnestly for the faith delivered to the saints. We live in a day when discernment must be given center stage. We live in an hour where men must not be afraid to think and to reason in line with the Holy Scriptures. Right? Because we're in the midst of a battle. In case you don't understand, there are thoughts, ideas, philosophies, reasoning. You know, where do people get taken captive? It's in the church. Now, where did Paul meet his greatest uh, opposition? It was in a place where they were opening the Bible. He was opening too. Verse 14. I said unto Peter, Galatians 2.14. I said unto Peter, before them all, if you have been a Jew, live after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews. Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Right? Verse 16. Knowing that a man, it's not justified by the works of the law. <laughs> In other words, what was the boldness of Paul knowing that the man is not justified by the works of the law? Can you see? Did Peter have the knowledge that Paul had? My friend, is in verse 16. Peter is saying that you, Peter, you know. So Peter knew what Paul knew. But Peter's knowledge puffed up. Why? It wasn't given to edifying the saints. So it's not just knowledge, my dear friends. Don't open your mouth like a day old chicken and just be knowledge hungry. Yeah. Take knowledge and beyond that, press into how do these men and women use that knowledge? Is it used to bring men into bondage? What must we do? Uh, then like uh, Galatians 2, 5. No, not for the space of an hour. We don't give way. See, any knowledge of our liberty in Christ that then promotes the bondage to the brethren is nothing other than that hypocrisy found in Satan. No, the believer, the believer, 
the believer. The Bible says, come you out from amongst them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Every, every man, you see, knowledge is not the issue now. I'm telling you now, not after a while, knowledge is not the issue because Paul had taught the Corinthians knowledge. He says, but there's a knowledge that puffs up, but charity edifies. So Peter, Galatians 2, did not use what he knew well. He should have used it to serve the brethren. Is Peter always that way? No. Peter, actually, when you look at the grand scheme of things, was a cool man. In fact, let me say it again. You notice something about Peter there. He did not once, he did not once, right, attack Paul and say, ah, stop, Paul. You know I'm Peter? <laughs> you, you know me? P, 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 Peter. Ah, ah, Peter, now. You are talking to me. No. Peter was humble. Peter was spiritual. In fact, I can tell you, Peter was fatherly. You see, a father is not somebody who is always right. But a, fa a, pastor, a, a pastor or a father is one when the right is pointed to him or her, he will adjust and say the truth is superior. That's a father. So when you disciple people, it should be your joy that somebody that you are discipling is able to sit down you know, and think like Paul was thinking about, Paul, about Peter. And Peter did not say, ah, ah. R remember, where was Barnabas? Behind Peter. Let me tell you again. It is an all mark of immature Christians. All mark that they get into personality issues. Oh, well, look, me, oh, I am for Sister Olati. Me, I am for Pastor Seku. I, I, and Paul said, you are canal. Someone will say, I'm a Paul. And I will say, I'm of Apollos. And I will say, I'm a Peter. He says, you are carnal. Oh, no, somebody says, no, 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 I'm loyal. No, you are carnal. Carnality is personality concerned. But there's a person of God's world, the loyalty that matters the most. Yeah, a man that stands in defense to his own cost, to the fruit of the gospel. We are going to, see, that is what makes the Christianity so beautiful and virile. It makes it a strong force that it's on the earth. You know, now somebody said, Pastor well, what you just said now means that uh, my congregation should not respect me. If that's what you heard, you need prayers. Sincerely, you need prayers? That's not what we have said. What we have said is, we are raising men in the local assembly that must be able to ask us questions because they are thinking based upon what we've taught them. And some of what they are going to say will not make sense but we will respond to them because we want to encourage that tendency in them to ask questions. We must not be afraid of thinking people. The local church, the local assembly is an assembly of those who have taken Christ as their wisdom. Look at Acts 15 and I stop. Acts 15. Acts 15. Look at verse 1. And certain men, which came down from Judea, taught the brethren. So who are these? Teachers. Somebody will say, well, when your teacher is teaching you, just listen. Well, apparently, these men in Acts 15.1, they came from Judea. They came from the headquarters. They came from the pillars. We can say James Boyce again. Yeah? Certain men which came down from Judea, well, I was just joking about that one. In Galatians 2 was James Boyce. Here, it's not say James Boyce. They just came from Judea. Anyway, they're, they're just Jewish guys. That's all he's saying. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised. What does that look like? Bondage. Except you be circumcised, after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Verse 2, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them. So notice, Paul and Barnabas did not say, well, that man talking there is the teacher. We are going to agree with him. Hook, line, and sinker. If he says it, who am I? We don't even know because he's our teacher. No. Paul and Barnabas, they had no small, small dissension. Acts 15. Acts 15. There's a translation I read many years ago. I'm trying to locate it, uh, but time has failed me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember that translation. Right? Uh, Acts 15 too. It says, this, NIV, this brought Barnabas and, Barnab uh, and Paul into sharp dispute and debate with them. Yeah? Now, uh, let me read to you in the, let me try J.B. Phillips. Maybe it's J.B. J.B. Phillips there says, in verse 2, it says, uh, it says, uh, it says, naturally, 
Look at it again. <laughs> this is J.B. Phillips. I think it's J.B. Phillips, yeah. J.B. Phillips says in verse 2, Acts 15, 2, naturally, hey, this caused a serious upset among them. We a much earnest discussion followed with Paul and Barnabas. Can you see? Naturally, you know, see, as a believer, the truth of the gospel, your use of the truth of the gospel should make it that when certain things are said, when certain things are done, it should naturally cause a serious upset. They'll be like, no, no, that's bondage. That is bondage. That is not the truth of the gospel. Yeah, that is not the truth. Let me read one more version for you. That's the J.B. Phillips. Let me read for you the message. The message translation. Yeah, what are we talking about? We are talking about you giving attention to what men say, to understand what they've said, and you prioritizing our regard for the word of God, we examine what is said in the local church. Somebody said, you see that pastor, he always talks so gently. He picks his word one by one. He speaks like a dove. So whatever he says is right. Ah, no. You are not against the pastor. You are examining the words. Believers must do their thinking for themselves. Now, see, yeah, it's a message translation. Message, uh, 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 Acts 15 verse 2. Paul and Barnabas were up on their feet at once in fierce protest. Yeah, the church decided to resolve the matter by sending Paul and Barnabas and a few others to put them before the apostles and leaders in Jerusalem. Notice, they didn't tell them, uh uh, Barnabas, Paul, when did you guys start ministry? These boys that came from uh, Judea, uh, uh, you are not their level. No, Barnabas and Paul were up to their feet, the message of says, in fierce protest. My dear friends, see, where did we start from? Paul said in 1 Corinthians and chapter 10, yeah, and verse 15. I'll leave you with those words. It says, uh, I speak as to wise men, judge what I say. Well, guys, it's been a pleasure to bring you the truth of God's word.